You are live. You are live. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. We are so glad to be with you today um, to discuss the issue of illicit financial flow uh, in the context of Africa. We are delighted that we have uh, two experts with us who will be helping us understand this topic. Um, just to, uh, you know, organize our thoughts, I thought that I would remind you what uh, illicit financial flows are, because if we don't do that, then we, we don't really understand uh, what it is that uh, we are talking about. So first and foremost, uh, the, we are from Advocacy Network for Africa, and Advocacy Network of, Afri um, Network of Africa is a group of civil society organizations that work on improving life in Africa through our advocacy in Washington, D.C. Um, we are predominantly uh, people from Africa, but we do have other colleagues uh, who have been working with us. So, um, and uh, we thought of organizing this meeting for us to be able to converse more about the issue of illicit financial flow. And we do have a working group called uh, Illicit Financial uh, Flow Working Group, which uh, Bahati chairs for us. And Imani and I are members of that. So um, just to bring to your understanding is uh, the fact that Africa is losing so much just a recent uh, UNICAD, uh, UNITAD's report said that uh, every year Africa loses almost $89 uh, billion through illicit financial flow. Uh, that is 3.7% of all uh, African countries' budgets. And how is this happening? This uh, happens by the illegal transfer of uh, money or resources from the continent of Africa to other parts of the world. So it's, it's usually a cross-border transaction of capital in some forms. Sometimes it is through illegal trade, uh, such as trafficking you know, uh, of persons, but it can also be trafficking of resources. Uh, it can be avoidance of tasks. It can be a form of corruption that enables um, African leaders to hide their money in places where African citizens cannot access. So they come in different forms, but Bahati and uh, Imani will help us understand them more, more. But I just wanted to say that it is important for us to understand the impact that illicit financial flow has in our continent, because according to experts, the aid provided from overseas, the development funds uh, is actually almost to the amount that we are losing annually, which if it was uh, the, uh, retained in the continent, it would help us fight poverty. It would help us uh, reduce conflict because a lot of uh, conflict around illicit financial flow is happening in different parts of uh, Africa. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce our experts so that they can actually tell you um, uh, what they've been working on, how they understand this issue. But even before I introduce our speakers, I would like to say that we would want this uh, webinar to be interactive. So please, um, when it is time to have a conversation between us, we welcome you to send your questions, uh, write them on the Q&A, and our panelists uh, will be able to respond to you uh, fast come, fast serve, and we hope that we'll have a great conversation. And I do wish you a very good EAD this year, and I hope that you are enjoying your time uh, with, in the virtual conversation. So let me begin by Imani Countess. Um, she directs the US Africa Bridge Building Project, which works to facilitate relationships between the US, uh, I mean, between US based and African economic equality activities. 
activist, sorry. For more than 35 years, Imani has worked for people-centered policies that support the democratic right of all uh, to human rights and self-determination. Um, uh, Imani comes with a lot of uh, experience. She has worked for the Open uh, Society Foundation. She has worked for the National Democratic Institute, Trans Africa, uh, American Friends Service Committee, African Development Foundation, Africa Policy Information Center, and the Washington Office on Africa. Imani, we are so pleased to um, be with you, and uh, we, we're going to um, be blessed that you are here to share with us um, your expertise. I also want to introduce um, Tama Bahati, who is a policy analyst with Africa Faith and Justice Network since 2007. He's originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. He holds an undergrad, uh, undergraduate degree in philosophy from La, La Rusizi in Bukavu, DRC, and a Master of Divinity uh, for, uh, and Masters of Arts in Ethics from the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. Both our panelists uh, have a wealth of experience that they will be sharing with us today. And I want uh, to invite you to join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you. <laughs> We're gonna start with Bahati, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pauline, uh, uh, for accepting to moderate this uh, uh, conversation. And I want our uh, audience to know that you are joining us from Kenya uh, <laughs> in South Africa. So um, we are going to talk about illicit financial flows, how it undermines democracy and human rights. My role on this panel is to set the context in which these illicit financial flow, uh, flows happen. I begin by making this statement. Africa is not poor, but it is impoverished. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are more than happy to, to be able to have this story heard by them. There are many people who have their stories, but they, no one can hear them. You are passionate about social justice. You are here because you want to do something about it. So let me set the context for you for today's conversation. Uh, when you hear about Africa, very little is said about what really Africa has to offer. I would like to just take a minute to ask you to put in the chat what really, uh, when you hear Africa, what comes to your mind? What is it that you associate with Africa or your friends ever associated with Africa um, when you heard about Africa? So if you don't mind putting in the chat, um, maybe what, what comes to your mind when you hear about Africa? Um, as we wait for your texts, your, your messages, I would like just to say that uh, Africa is really associated with wealth when people are conversing about Africa. And I want to say that Africa has great things associated with it. Do you know that Africa is the largest continent of all seven? Uh, that we have on our planet. Africa is home to the second largest forest, rainforest, uh, after the Amazon. And this forest is critical to our existence today, particularly in the context of climate change. The rainforest goes from uh, Cameroon, Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Central African Republic, um, and the Equatorial Guinea, and Gabon. Africa has the longest river, another great resource. 30% of Africa's world's known minerals are in Africa. 
and half of the world uh, cobalt is found in the Democratic Republic of Congo. These are resources that are there for Africans. But really, when we speak about Africa, we associate Africa with these great resources. But most importantly, Africa is home to a uh, um, great human resource. Africa has the workforce that it needs to really make it the continent that they want. Um, if put in the right conditions, this workforce is gifted and is able to unlock the doors or the door to prosperity, safety, and democracy and build the Africa they want. Unfortunately, a close look at the state of Africa's management of the resources that I don't have much time to re, uh, uh, name in details. That look says that the state of the management of Africa's resources is not good. That's the state. Africa is poor, but it is impoverished, depriving the majority of Africans of the a dignified life. Africa's resources are managed by autocratic regimes. Decisions are made by an individual. Some African resources are managed by autocratic regimes. It is a government by thieves. They loot, they hide the, the, their loot abroad. They use network of criminal financial, uh, financial criminal um, networks, mm -hmm. and they launder the money while their compatriots are in serious poverty. Tyrannic regimes they seize power with the promise to restore order, but they use the same power to indeed become kleptocrats and autocrats. I will go as far as say that some of the regimes are idiocracies, whereas the democratic system they put out is totally broken. They go through the, the system of voting and so on, but when you look at the one who's managing the resources to deliver the Africa that we want or the country that we desire, you will think it's a band of things. Yes, it is very strong. But when you look at uh, what people think of Africa, with all that we have, it begs to ask what is wrong with that continent. So, that being said, there are many things that we can ask, we can that justify what is actually happening. So, these type of regimes have undermined the transition of Africa from developing to develop to, to developed continent. These type of governments offer the best environment for exploitation by foreign entities. And those corrupt, corrupt, uh, corrupt leaders in, in collaboration with foreigners, then they set up the exploitation of the people. So yes, where is accountability? Where are the taxes that are due to Africa? So I believe that at this point, my colleague Imani is able to lead us and take this reflection a little more to, into the details of where are the taxes that these corporations should be paid? And 
who else is involved. And probably later we will talk about what can we do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bahati, for helping us understand uh, Africa is not poor. We have so many resources. Uh, and, uh, you know, the unfortunate thing is that we do not control those resources. And they are definitely getting taken away from us in a criminal way. Um, and the raping of the continent of Africa continues. So thank you so much for, you know, bringing light to what is actually happening. And thank you so much. Um, Imani, uh, take us to the next level, please. Thank well, you. thank you so much, Pauline. Thank you, Bahati. Uh, and thanks to those of you that are joining us this morning to discuss this intersection of human rights and illicit financial flows. And as um, uh, Pauline uh, defined broadly, uh, fi illicit financial flows are, in the short definition, funds transferred across an international border us using financial instruments that are either illegal or illegitimate because of the cause, because of the harm they cause to societies. Um, more specifically, what is being described is a process by which Africa's resources are stolen on a massive scale. Today, corporations, criminals, and corrupt officials steal more than $80 billion a year. And the theft is accomplished through a number of complex mechanisms that are grouped under the term illicit financial flows. But across the continent, we see widespread theft in the extractive sector, mining oil and gas, along with agricultural extraction, rubber, palm oil, and timber. We see widespread tax evasion and tax avoidance. For example, right now, uh, this year, South Africa's dealing with um, the of 70 of all the taxes uh, on all the gold that was mined in 2019. And that theft involves two family owned corporations, one in Zimbabwe, one in South Africa, along with gold networks in Dubai and banks in Mauritius. We see criminal activity. Africa's coastal countries lose billions per year to illegal fishing. Ghana loses about 100 million a year as a result of foreign vessels from the EU, China, Russia, Taiwan. And these vessels operate without authorization from African countries and are decimating fish stocks. This week, I don't know how many folks saw this article, but this week, the New York Times reported that Bain and Company, a US-based company that reports $4.5 billion in revenue and has 58 offices around the world, collusion with former South African President Zuma worked during Zuma's time as president to overhaul South Africa's revenue service. And the outcome was to stymie the to provide basic services like housing and electricity. And this story is being told now after a whole series of hearings in South Africa that have spanned over four years. And I want folks to kind of think about this a little bit. A U.S. corporation facilitating corruption in Africa whose work was paid for by, by, uh, uh, by South Africa's public resources for the purpose of undermining how public resources are collected. And this is not just about the money lost. People were harmed. The people of South Africa were harmed when the revenue authority responsible for collecting monies for the purpose of the public good uh, have fewer resources to invest in their development. Um, throughout Africa, people are harmed uh, and their polit political, cultural, economic, and labor rights are violated because their resources are stolen and they're left without the means to invest in development. 
While the financial flows attributed to a relatively small amount of that $89 billion overall, I've personally been particularly struck by the impact of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. And it sticks with me because fish is a regular part of my diet. And so every time I'm eating fish, I'm asking myself, am I eating illegal, unregulated, unreported fish? And in this area, again, we're not only talking about money. Overfishing also destroys marine ecosystems. It disrupts trade and fosters economic migration. So what does this mean? It means, again, governments don't have the money they need to invest in development. Governments and citizens don't have the resources to address climate change. Livelihoods are destroyed, as is the case with the fishing sector. And all of this really helps maintain this false narrative of African incompetence and African corruption. In the global north, it fosters a whole host of development initiatives that are focused on addressing corruption and governance, not focused on the drivers of corruption and the causes of poor governance, one of which is corporate commercial theft. Illicit financial flows are a global issue, but they disproportionately impact Africa. And African governments, African countries, are calling for an end to these illicit financial flows and the unconditional repatriation of stolen assets. One of the missing links in this global call is us. It's the US. And I'm really hoping that during the discussion, we can have a conversation about the ways in which we individually and working with our, within our, our organizational structures can, de can develop the stra strategies and tactics that are needed to really chip away at eventually ending US policies and structures that continue to facilitate the ongoing theft of Africa's resources. I want to quickly mention uh, two things that folks can do immediately. Um, first, there are a couple of resources that I hope were shared. I, I uploaded a couple of PDFs. hope you have access to. Just to take a look at those. Um, feel free to contact, frankly, any of us um, through the uh, EAD conferencing software, connect with us so that we can continue this conversation either as individuals or as Pauline mentioned, as a part of the uh, Advocacy Network for Africa working group. Um, and one of the handouts that should be available to you is a, it's labeled call to action. And it, it, asked, it, asked, it asked that you consider signing a petition, which is, um, uh, on the online platform, and that petition asks our Africa subcommittee leaders in the House of Representatives to hold hearings uh, and to take a comprehensive look at illicit financial flows. So uh, based upon your questions uh, and observations, we can have a much deeper kind of conversation about the mechanisms. I look forward to that. Uh, we were very, very um, intentional about ensuring that we had enough time uh, in this conversation to actually have a conversation. And so um, uh, with that, I'm going to bring my remarks to a close. Thank you. Thank you so much, Imani, for um, articulating for us uh, deeper what this really means uh, and how it is impacting uh, people of Africa. And the fact that it is not just limited to um, finances, but it is also impacting uh, climate change in the continent. And and uh, actually, there are reports that the more we see illicit financial flow from the continent, the more we see poverty rising, the more we see hunger rising. Um, when you are talking about the uh, companies uh, and the, the, the mining, and I was thinking of how um, our continent, you know, with all its wealth, 
uh, the, it, it, it is not only that we are not benefiting from the wealth, but it is also because uh, the environment is being destroy, destroyed in the process. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a multiple of issues. And then when you add conflict on top of that, and then they sit back and corruption, and they sit back and say, these Africans are so corrupt. These Africans are always poor. Uh, these Africans can't help themselves. Uh, and, uh, and yet they are orchestras. There's someone or these multinational corporations are actually orchestrating uh, some of what is raising poverty in the continent, destroying the fish industry in the continent. Um, and, you know, uh, there was a time when um, the, 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 the Nile patch was introduced in Lake Victoria and destroyed all local uh, foods or local fish uh, in, the, in Lake Victoria. Uh, and uh, once they were taking the fish from Lake Victoria to sell in Europe and Asia, and it wasn't enough for them, so they introduced the Nile patch, which is a very aggressive fish. It eats all the other fish. And in the process, um, they also would use the planes that they were using to take the fish to Europe and to Asia. Uh, they would also bring weapons into uh into the 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 african continent uh as you all know we don't manufacture that many weapons in the continent but they come from you know elsewhere uh, and somebody is actually getting rich uh through the different conflicts that have started due to the struggle for local resources that already are being exploited exploited by uh, corporations so um, thank you very much. I do see people are now writing questions. Um, I think I did request that you put them in the uh, Q and A. Um, so if you haven't put your question in the uh, Q and A, please do so. But the first uh, question is, uh, what is and this is from Madi Lindahi. Uh, what is the role of INGOs in illicit financial flows? Um, I'm going to ask these three questions and then uh, you can take turns in responding to them. Have you seen progress? Uh, this is the second one, Lydia Andrews. Have you seen progress to curb illicit financial flows over the years? Can you talk about some success or examples that we can look to? She also asked a second question. What do you feel is the most important thing for us to do in the US today? Uh, so go ahead, Bahad, uh, well, Iman. I'd like to start off with the last question because I really think the most important thing for us to do in the U.S. is to educate ourselves. And it's, it's not easy because these are really complicated mechanisms, right? I, I, I'll be honest, it's taken me like three years to even understand the basics, right? So they're really complicated mechanisms and i and so uh, to the extent that you can read the resources that are distributed connect with some of the organizations that that are, are doing um actively engaged in work on illicit financial flows like the advocacy network uh, for africa um, working group um and then there are a couple of other washington dc based based groups that would be the first step please just you know, try to uh, begin to kind of mine out the uh, the, the details, um, some of the details uh, on your own and then work with others as we're trying to do the, the same thing. Um, has there been progress? Uh, yes. Um, the there, There's always, for as long as I've been working on Africa, been this issue of, of um, exploitation and capital flows from the continent to different parts of, of the world. Um, but it wasn't until 2015 that the, the UN Economic Commission on Africa uh, released a report, a high level report on illicit financial flows. And that report has really galvanized over the past several years 
work at a lot of different levels, um, including the Africa-wide level, at the United Nations, as well as uh, within specific countries. Because this is an umbrella set of, of organizations, you've got, uh, excuse me, or not organizations, or mechanisms, they are criminal elements, there are corporate elements, um, and there are corruption related, you know, um, uh, elements of this, of this as well. And that means that um, there's work, work needed in a number of different sectors. So at the local, national level, right, uh, there are African countries that are working on uh, upgrading their tax structures so that they can, I, these bad actors. And so in Kenya, where Pauline is, one of the major exports is uh, uh, related to floriculture, flowers. And um, there is a subsidiary of a uh, Netherlands that grows and exports flowers. They reported to the government of Kenya no profits. This is, a, this is a, a story that's a couple years old. They made no profits because everything they made was dumped into the uh, cost of, of production. But what they actually had done was, was undersold the flowers to their mother corporation in the Netherlands. So they're reporting no profits because they sold their flowers at nine cents a stem instead of at 19 cents a stem, which was the market rate. So those kinds of things, um, you, our revenue authorities are able to uncover and uh, begin to um, you know, demand. That's happening in different, it's a long time, complicated and so on. Um, the fact that this has become a, 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 an issue that is discussed in the EU, in the UN, and throughout Africa is a sign of progress, right? We are not talking about it. Our government is not talking about it in the ways in which it should. And that means not only are we then not aware, but it means that the possibility of comprehensive, coordinated, policies are made impossible, right? Because our administration is not looking at it in that way. Um, I've been talking for a bit. Uh, Bahati, there's a third question yes. about the role of um, international NGOs in, in illicit financial flows. I don't, I, I, would you care to comment on that or any of the other uh, questions that have been uh, put forward? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to just quickly mention that uh, there have been um, a lot of um, mobilization to address the hiding of, of uh, resources in shell companies abroad, which also affects uh, the United States. There are many Americans who are also very good at really hiding these resources to uh, not so that they don't pay resource um, taxes here. So they, uh, there is uh, they, they, they a series of legislations that have been proposed. First, the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Authorization Act uh, in the Senate. Uh, it, uh, the number is S93. We have the Combating Global Corruption Act uh, S14 uh, in the Senate and in the House, it's HR 4322. Uh, there is another one, the, trans the Transnational Repressive Accountability and Prevention, uh, and Prevention Act, uh, S 15991 in Senate and HR 4806. There is the Justice for Victims of Kleptocracy Act, S2010 or uh, HR 3781, and then we have the corruption, the Foreign Corruption Accountability Act. Uh, right now, right now, 
we need uh, a lot of mobilization to give the resources for the uh, for the um, uh, the U.S. Uh, the the Financial Crime Enforcement Network, which is a, a U.S. government uh, uh, institution, to do the work that needs to be done to track down some of these activities, uh, particularly to implement the corrupt the the Corporate uh, Transparency Act. Uh, we know one. Of, this is one of the the, the things that many uh, some of us uh, uh, need to communicate clearly. Um, there is a way that the U.S. can enact a law that will have significant impact on what is going abroad and in Africa in particular. For example, the Dodd-Frank uh, law in, of 2010 in Section 1502, it was really it targeted the, what was going on in Central Africa in the, in, um, in terms of uh, financing the war that devastated the Democratic Republic of Congo. And when it was enacted, uh, it did have significant uh, effect in reducing the traffic of coltan and unreported coltan. So just a few comments in Africa. Thank you. Thank um, you so I'm much, Bahati um, and Imani, uh, for responding to those questions. I think one of the other points that we should mention is the fact that the, there is uh, efforts right now to uh, return assets uh, back to the continent. Um, the AU is involved in that, but also it is an effort that has been led by uh, the INGOs. Uh, and civil society groups uh, in the continent have been, um, you know, advocating for resources stolen from the continent to be returned. And we have seen a few successes uh, in Angola. We see that um, in uh, Kenya, there is a recent story also. Uh, and I can see if I can get the links and, and post them before we finish. Um, but there is also a very uh, powerful story coming from DRC uh, when the DRC uh, rejected the deal, um, you know, to, with a mining company which has been exploiting people in DRC by paying very little money to extract resources from there and then just enriching themselves. And the fact that DRC also has ask uh, an Israeli billionaire to uh, relinquish the um, mining companies that it was controlling uh, in the DRC. Um, and we've seen this happen in other parts of the continent. But it, for me, it's, it's, it's not work, it, the work is not done. I think there is need to empower more local civil society groups to be able to push uh, for this locally, especially through democratic systems. Um, and there is another question which the two of you can respond to, if you could. Uh, and it says, uh, can you speak to the role of the World Bank, IMF, and African Development Bank in illicit financial flows? Can any one of you take on that? Well, uh, just very quickly, I really can't. Uh, I, I, I that's something that it's a really good question. Thank, thank you for raising it, but it's not something that I can particularly answer. I would like to add a little bit on to the previous question about the role of international um, in NGOs. And, and international NGOs have played a tremendous role in advancing this whole conversation around this global conversation around the list of financial flows. There are some um, uh, uh, international organizations like the Kenya-based Tax Justice Network Africa, which, which is working with governments, African governments, to provide levels of technical assistance and also to help organize uh, parliamentarians across the African continent <clears throat> and uh, resource um, uh, some of the revenue authorities so that they can build the capacity to begin to confront some of these really technically uh, complex
six areas. There are international um, NGOs, that, many of which are based in the US and uh, Europe, which are working on the issues of corporate transparency with whistleblowing information that's been gleaned from some of the big releases of, of documents, the Panama Papers, etc., uh, Pandora Papers. Um, and those documents include, include information on the ways in which um, illicit, uh, in which corporations and, and governments collude in this, in this area. Um, I I want to just really quickly, I know we only have like four minutes left, but I just want to mention really quickly that one of these mechanisms, because I didn't speak very much about the mechanism, but um, this 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 um, situation that I described in Kenya of um, uh, the relationship between a, a global corporation and its subsidiary is called transfer pricing. And transfer pricing is global, right? Corporations do it all around the globe, um, and it and and countries in the global South, Africa in particular, are negatively affected, right? And so this issue of transfer pricing that several research organizations that are focused on illicit financial flows are engaged in uh, trying to uh, expose, right? Thank last, you. The last comment on, on transfer pricing. I'll be very, very quick. Um, again, this is not only an Africa problem. Right now, the U.S. Yeah. has determined that Coca-Cola is liable for $3.2 billion for its own transfer pricing schemes. So mm -hmm. it's global. Thank you. Thank you for those real examples. Uh, they are very helpful. And uh, Bahati, I, I would like to respond to the World Bank, but I want to give you the, the chance to do that quickly. And then we we'll see whether anybody else has a final question or comment. And then I can see that we only have two minutes left. Bahati, go. Uh, in terms of uh, the World Bank enabling uh, illicit financial flows, I can point to the World Bank own uh, program uh, called Doing Business, which is a program that it was meant to en enable the, the business environment in, uh, um, in developing countries, practically telling these countries, uh, loosen up your uh, laws so that investors can come in and uh, then on the report, you will, you will be uh, ranked as a country where business is in the environment is good. The World Bank itself in 2010 uh, did uh, pause the reporting because they said there have been irregularities in the, in the reporting. Practically, they acknowledged that it was a scheme that wasn't appropriate and they did about it for a long time. So they are also on the bench of the accused. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, in in the past, uh, I think, you know, uh, the World Bank has played a critical role in opening up African countries to exploitation. So, but at the same time, I think they, because of the civil society's advocacy role, uh, in those settings, they are now beginning to accept that there needs to be more transparency uh, in in this uh, multinational corporation setting. And they, uh, the best thing I think the World Bank and IMF are doing is to produce a report of how illicit financial uh, flow impacts African countries. You know, so uh, we 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 now have a better understanding of what is actually happening because they are producing those reports without those reports or data we wouldn't actually know what is happening even if they are not stopping it but at least they are telling us what is happening and now th the next step for that uh, those institutions is to provide because for them they are looking at it from a development perspective and they are saying that illicit financial flow is hampering 
development progress in the continent. But now the next step is how do you stop that? And the, the, the suggestions I've seen them provide don't always bear because they are saying we have to stop uh, governments themselves have to come up with laws, have to come up with protection, but they forget that most of the time the decisions are not made even with those, within those countries. We are out of time, my friends, and we are so glad that you are able to join us. If there was sufficient more time, we would have discussed further, but um, our emails, I think we can put, uh, oh, uh, you put your email, uh, Imani, Bahati, you and I can type our emails quickly and people can reach out. If you want to learn more about illicit financial flow, please you can contact any uh, any one of us and we can see how we can, edu we can continue to educate one another. And the last thing I would say is the need for INGOs to educate people in the uh, United States about this because the, the, the uh, media there is not going to do it. So we need the faith community, especially. We are at AED. The faith community needs to do the education of its own uh, members so that they understand what is happening with illicit financial flow. And we are happy to help with that. If you need help, uh, people who can train your, your communities on this so that they can be better advocate and be in better solidarity with African countries. So thank you so much. I ran out of the sun. It's, it's already sunset here and I am outside. So I need to get back inside where there is light. And I want to say thank you to Bahati and to Imani for a very productive conversation. And to everyone who participated, we thank you for all the work that you are doing. And the fact that you are here shows that you care and uh, we appreciate your solidarity and we will continue this conversation. So thank you very much and uh, be blessed and have a great week. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.